Hello, thanks for choosing to listen to this drama. This is a quick message before we get started, but I promise I'll be brief. I'm Noel from Boxtail Soup, and if you don't know us, we're a UK theatre company creating original adaptations with a unique style. Have a look at our website for more. At the beginning of 2020, we had a full calendar and possibly our busiest and most exciting year ahead. But of course, when COVID-19 arrived, everything changed for almost everyone. For us, that meant all performances were cancelled and no shows means no income from tickets at all. Since we couldn't get out and perform, we decided to create the piece of work you're listening to now. It's a new format for us and we've learned a lot of new skills along the way. After a lot of discussion, we decided to make this available without an upfront cost so that anyone could enjoy it no matter what their circumstances. During the lockdown, some people are doing okay financially and some people have lost work and don't have anything to spare. Believe me, we understand that. However, this recording isn't free. It's taken us a lot of time and effort to put it together. So what we're asking for in return is your help. If you can afford the price of a ticket, we hope you'll make a £5 donation. And maybe if two of you listen together, perhaps you can make that £5 each. If you can afford to, and you'd like to support the company further, please consider becoming a patron and making a regular donation every month. That would make a huge difference in helping Boxtail Soup survive this crisis to keep making work in the future. And it also gives you access to a few goodies that aren't available anywhere else. And if you don't have any money, if you can't afford to make any donation, we still hope that you'll listen and enjoy the show. There's another way to help us. Spread the word, share the show, Tweet about it, Facebook, Instagram about it, talk to other people face-to-face about it, let them know, and maybe they'll buy a ticket in return. We wanted to make this available for everyone, regardless of their circumstances, in the hope that if you enjoy it, you'll help in whatever way you can. We love what we do, and we hope you do too. We want to make sure Boxtail Soup is still around the next time we get a chance to perform live in front of you. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the show. Turn of the Screw, adapted by Boxtail Soup, from the novel by Henry James. If you're of a nervous disposition, please refrain from listening. It came to me in 1961, via a private sale from a collector who I never met and never heard from again. I found the diary hidden in the lining at the bottom of the case. It was in an old envelope, sealed with wax. Nobody till now has ever heard her story. It's beyond everything. Nothing at all that I know touches it. It's written in old, faded ink and in the most beautiful hand. She had been offered a position by a splendid young man to take care of his young niece and nephew. She was young, untried, nervous. The salary offered much exceeded her modest measure, and the young man was charming. He told me that several applicants were simply afraid, all because of his main condition, that I should should never never trouble him. him. Never. 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 Neither appeal, nor complain, nor write. Take the whole thing over and let him alone. I promised to do this, and when he held my hand thanking me, I already felt rewarded. I remember the whole beginning as a succession of flights and drops, a little seesaw of the right and the wrong. At first, I found myself doubtful, felt sure I had made a mistake. But driving on a lovely day through countryside which seemed to offer me a friendly welcome, my fortitude mounted afresh. I suppose I had expected or dreaded something so melancholy that what greeted me was a good surprise. I remember, as a most pleasant impression, the broad, clear front with its open windows. I remember the lawn and the bright flowers, the crunch of my wheels on the gravel, the rooks circling and cawing in the golden sky. The scene had a greatness, 
that made it a very different affair from my own simple home. Good afternoon, miss. Oh, it's such a pleasure to meet you. We're so very glad to have you here. I'm Mrs Gross, miss, the housekeeper here at Bly. It is a pleasure to meet you too, Mrs Gross. Thank you. And who is this charming creature? The little girl who accompanied Mrs Gross, with her hair of gold and her frock of blue, was the most beautiful child I had ever seen. Well, this is Flora, miss, the youngest of your two pupils. I am very pleased to meet you too, Flora. I think we shall soon be great friends. And her brother, does he look like her? Is he too so very remarkable? Oh, miss, most remarkable. Well, if you think well of this one, you will be carried away by the little gentleman. Well, I think that is what I came for, to be carried away. I'm afraid I was rather easily carried away by their uncle in London. Well, you're not the first, and I dare say you won't be the last. Oh, I have no pretension to being the only one. My other pupil, at any rate, as I understand, comes back tomorrow. Not tomorrow. Friday, miss. I shall look forward to it. Please, miss, would you like me to show you the house? Oh, yes, please, Flora. Follow me. I spent the afternoon with Flora, arranged that she should show me the place. She showed it step by step, room by room and secret by secret, with the result in half an hour of our becoming immense friends. Oh, yes, my dear. This way, follow me. I'll show you everything, everything. The great staircase, all the dusty old empty rooms above. Oh, and the square tower. I'm not allowed to go up there, but if you would come with me, we could go all the way to the top. Perhaps not now, Flora. It'll make me dizzy after all this excitement. <laughs> come on. Miss, this way. This way, hurry. Quick. Young as she was, I was struck throughout our little tour with her confidence and courage along the way, in empty chambers and dull corridors, on crooked staircases, and at the sight of this looming square tower that certainly made me pause. She continued to dance before me round corners and patter down passages, until finally, well into the evening. This will be your bedroom. It's the best one in the house. Mrs. Gross says we must leave you to settle in by yourself tonight. But tomorrow, my bed will be moved in here with you, my dear. And then we will share. Won't that be fun? Thank you, Flora. Good night. I slept little that night. I was too much excited. I rose several times to wander about my room. To look at such portions of the house as I could catch and to listen. Good morning, miss. I trust you settled in all right. There's a letter, miss, from the children's uncle. Arrived this morning. Thank you, Mrs Gross. The enclosed letter I recognise is from Mars's headmaster, and the headmaster's an awful bore. <laughs> Read him, please deal with him, but mind you don't trouble me. Not a word about it. And here's the letter he speaks of. Dear Sir, I am writing in regard to your nephew, Miles. But what does this mean? Miles is dismissed from his school. Well, aren't they all sent home, miss? Oh, sent home, yes, but only for the holidays. Miles may never go back at all. What has he done? Well, here, please, see for yourself. Oh, such things are not for me, miss. Oh, I... 
really bad? Does the letter say so? Oh, they go into no particulars. It simply states that it is impossible to keep him. That can have only one meaning. It is an injury to the others. Oh, Master Miles? Him? An injury? Why, oh, it's too dreadful to say such cruel things. He's scarce ten years old, miss. Oh, yes. Yes, it would be incredible. Oh, see him first, miss. Then believe it. Well, you might as well believe it of Miss Flora, bless her. I take it then that you've never known him to be bad? Oh, never known him? Well, I don't pretend that, miss. Then you have known him to be bad? Well, yes, indeed. Thank God. You like them with the spirit to be naughty. Well, so do I. But not in the degree to contaminate. To contaminate? To corrupt. <laughs> Are you afraid he'll corrupt you? What can you tell me about the lady who was here before? The last governess. Well, she was all so young and pretty. Almost as young and almost as pretty as you, miss. He seems to like us young and pretty. Oh, he did. It was a way he liked everyone. I mean, that's his way. The masters. But of whom did you speak first? Well, of him, of course. Of the children's uncle? Well, who else? Did the last governess see anything in the boy? Oh, that wasn't right. She never told me, miss. Was she careful? Particular? About some things, yes. But not about all? Yeah, well, miss, she's gone. I won't tell tales. I quite understand your feeling. Why did she leave? Well, sorry to say, well, she died, miss. Well, she left at the end of the year to go home, as she put it, for a short holiday. We had a young nursemaid who stayed on. She was a good girl and she took the children all together for the interval. But our young lady never came back. And at the very moment I was expecting her, I heard from the master that she was dead. But of what? He never told me. Oh, but please, miss, I must get back to my work. Two days later, I drove over to meet the little gentleman. I was a little late, and he stood wistfully looking out for me. Hello, Miles. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. It is a pleasure to meet you. I've heard so much about you. Hello. You must be our new governess. Yes, indeed, Miles. Well, I'm awfully glad to meet you too, my dear. And now, please may we go home. I've so missed Bly and Flora and the others... I saw him in a great glow of freshness, the same purity I had first seen in his little sister. It would have been impossible to carry a bad name with a greater sweetness of innocence, and by the time I got back to Bly with him, I was bewildered, if not outraged, by the sense of the horrible letter locked up in my drawer. It is absurd. You mean what the letter says? He doesn't live an instant. What will you say then, miss? In answer to the letter? Nothing. And to the children's uncle? Nothing. And to the boy himself? Nothing. Well, then I'll stand by you, miss. We'll see it out. We'll see it out. Well, would you mind, miss? May I be so bold? Oh, yes. Of course. I took the good creature in my arms, and after we had embraced like sisters, I felt still more fortified. For the first time in my life, I knew space and air and freedom. I learned to be amused, and even amusing, and not to think of tomorrow. I was off my guard. The children gave me so little trouble. They were of a gentleness so extraordinary. It was a time of calm and stillness. Often, after the children had gone to bed, I could walk in the grounds and enjoy the beauty and dignity of the place. 
I fancied it would be charming suddenly to meet someone. Someone would appear before me, a smile on his handsome face. Suddenly the sounds of the evening dropped. The rooks stopped cawing in the golden sky. It was as if the scene had been stricken with death. There, high up at the top of the square tower, a man stood behind the battlements, his hands on the ledge, as definite as a picture in a frame. He never took his eyes from me. Even as he turned away, still markedly fixed me. He turned away. That was all I knew. I was rooted as deeply as I was shaken. I can't say how long I remained there. I only recall that when I re-entered the house, darkness had quite closed in. Mrs. Gross! Mrs. Gross, do we have a visitor? Has anyone come to the house? No, miss. I don't believe so, no. You are certain? No man has come calling here? Yes, miss, I'm certain. There's no one. Mrs. Gross, I saw someone just now. An extraordinary man at the top of the square tower, standing there, looking down at me. What extraordinary man? I haven't the least idea. Well, I suppose it must have been someone from about the place. A man from the village. Well, you can climb the tower from the grounds, miss. I expect he'd come to take in the view. We've had it happen now and then, curious folk. But you needn't worry, miss. The door to the house is kept locked, always. Perhaps. I think I shall retire, Mrs Gross. Good night. Good night, miss. My dear? Yes, Miles? Well, Flora and I have made up a dance for you. Well, do let us show you. Yes, please let us show you. Miles made it up. I know you will like it. Well, yes, of course, my dears. Well, very well, then. Let's begin. Flora, take your position. That's right. And don't forget to curtsy when I bow, just like I talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, beautiful, my dears. Beautiful. Oh, Flora, take care. Too many spins and you're sure to fall. <laughs> My charming work with Miles and Flora was a constant joy. I was dazzled by their loveliness. Of course, I was under the spell, and perfectly knew I was. Miles, Flora, you must get ready for church. Fetch your hats and coats, please. Now, hat, shawl, coat. Where are my gloves? Or oh, perhaps I left them in the drawing room. It's you. He was looking straight in, his face close to the glass. Who are you? What do you want? He was the same. He was the same. He remained but a few seconds, but he also saw and recognized. His stare was as deep and hard as before. But it quitted me for a moment fixing on several other things. It was not for me he had come here. He had come for someone else. What in the name of goodness is the matter, miss? You're as white as a sheet. He was there. He was there at the window looking for someone. What do you mean? Who was there, miss? That man. That man from the tower. Are you sure, miss? The same gentleman? Oh, yes, I'm sure. But he's no gentleman. He's... He's... God help me if I know what he is. It's time we should be at church. Oh, I'm not fit for church. You're afraid? I'm afraid of him. 
What's he like? He's like nobody. Nobody? He has no hat. He has a pale face, long in shape, with straight, good features. His eyes are small, sharp, rather fixed. His mouth's wide and his lips are thin. He's tall, upright, but never, no, never a gentleman. A gentleman? A gentleman, he? You know him, then? But he is handsome. Remarkably. And dressed? In somebody's clothes. They're smart, but they're not his own. But they're the masters. You do know him? Quint. Quint? Peter Quint. The master's valet when he was here. He never wore his hat, but he did wear. But there were waistcoats missed. They were both here last year. And then the master went and Quint was alone. Alone? Alone with us. In charge. And what became of him? He went to. Went where? God knows where. He died. Died? Yes. Peter Quint is dead. You said he was looking for someone, miss. For someone who was not you. He was looking for little Miles. That's whom he was looking for. But how do you know, miss? I know, and you know too, my dear. That's what he wants. He wants to appear to them. It was Quint's fancy that he and Master Miles were great friends. He liked to play with him. I mean, to spoil him. But Quint was much too free. Too free with everyone. And you never told their uncle. Well, he didn't like tale-bearing. He hated complaints. I dare say I was wrong, but really, I was afraid. Afraid of what? Of the things that man could do. Quint was so clever. He was so deep. You weren't afraid of anything else. Not of his effect on the children. They were in your charge. Oh, no, miss, they were not in my charge. But the master believed in Quint and put him here. So he was in charge. Yes, even of the children. What happened to him? What happened to Peter Quint? Early one morning, in the winter, he was found stone dead on the road from the village. It was an icy slope. It had been a dark night, and the drinker counted for much. But there was plenty in Peter Quint's life that would have accounted for a good deal more. I now saw that I had been asked for a service admirable and difficult. We were cut off, really, together. We were united in our danger. They had nothing but me. One afternoon, Flora and I took a stroll in the grounds. The sun was high and the day exceptionally warm. And we found ourselves in the cool shade of the trees by the edge of the lake. I do so love the lake, my dear. I think it is my very favourite part of Bly. I quite agree, Flora. On a beautiful day like this, it should soon be my favourite too. Suddenly, I became aware, on the other side of the lake, someone watching. My heart stood still for an instant, with the terror of whether Flora too would see the figure. I held my breath, waiting for a cry from her. I waited, but nothing came. Flora? Flora! It's time to go. I can give no intelligible account of how we returned to the house, but I got hold of Mrs. Gross as soon after this as I could. I can still hear myself cry out to her. They know. It's too dreadful. The children, they know. What do they know? Why all that we know, and heaven knows what else besides. Two hours ago by the lake, Flora saw... You mean she told you? Not a word. That's the horror. She kept it to herself. Well, then how do you know this? I was there. I saw, saw that she was perfectly aware. What do you mean, aware of him? No, of her. A woman, all in black, pale and dreadful, on the other side of the lake. 
My predecessor. The one who died. Miss Jessel. Miss Jessel. You don't believe me. Well, how can you be sure, Miss? Then ask Flora. She's sure. And for God's sake, don't. She'll say she isn't. She'll lie. Oh, how can you? Because I'm clear. Flora doesn't want me to know. She doesn't want you to. No. No. There are depths. Depths. The more I go over it, the more I see in it. And the more I see in it, the more I fear. You mean you're afraid of seeing her again? Oh, no. That's nothing. It's that Flora may see her again without my knowing it. The woman never gave me a glance. She only fixed the child. Fixed her? Oh, with such awful eyes. With a determination indescribable. A kind of fury of intention. To get hold of her. That's what Flora knows. She was all in black, you say? In mourning. Poor, rather shabby. But with extraordinary beauty. Oh, yes, handsome. Wonderfully, wonderfully handsome. But infamous. Oh, Miss Jessel was infamous. But they were both infamous. The time has come to give me the whole thing. I must have it now. Of what did she die? Come, there was something between them. Oh, there was everything. In spite of the difference. Oh, of their rank. Their condition. She was a lady, but him... I've never seen one like him. He did as he wished. With her? With them all. It must have also been what she wished. Oh, poor woman. She paid for it. Then you do know what she died of. No, no, I don't. I, I never wanted to. I was glad enough I didn't. I thank heaven that I was well out of it. But you had some idea. Of a real reason for leaving. Of course. As to that, she couldn't have stayed. Fancy it. Here. For a governess. And afterwards I imagined, and I still imagine, what I imagine is dread. But how can you be sure, Miss? How can you be sure that it was really those two? How can you doubt it? I have given you a description of each of the persons appearing to me to the last detail from which you have instantly recognised and named them. But there's something you must tell me. What was it you had in mind after the letter from the school when you said Miles had sometimes been bad? Since I have been here, he has been a little prodigy of delightful goodness. What was your exception? To what did you refer? Quint and Miles were always together. Or so much that I didn't think it was right. I even... I went to Miss Jessel... She just gave me the strangest look and told me to mind my business. I decided I must speak to Master Miles myself. I told him I didn't like to see a young gentleman forget his station. You reminded him that Quint was beneath him? As you might say. And it was his answer for one thing that was bad. And for another thing? He repeated your words to Quint? No, never that. But he denied certain occasions. What occasions? And they had been about together quite as if Quint were his tutor. And a very grand one at that. And Miss Jessel only for the little lady. When he had gone off with Quint and spent hours with him. He said he hadn't. I see he lied. Yes. Miss Jessel didn't care. She didn't forbid him. So you think Miles knew what was between them? You think he covered and concealed their relation? I don't know. I don't know. So while Miles was with Quint... Miss Flora was with Miss Jessel. It suited them all. I know now, more than ever, that I must watch. I waited, the days passing in constant sight of my pupils, without a fresh incident... Sometimes there were moments when one of them kept me occupied, while the other slipped away. But mostly they were extravagantly fond of me, entertaining and surprising me, reading me passages, telling me stories. 
of the sun. Oh, look at them. A carriage came driving up with eight white horses and... You're tired, Flora. I shall look forward to the ending tomorrow. Good night, my dear. Good night. Good night. I sat reading by candlelight. The white curtain draping the head of Flora's little bed shrouded the perfection of childish rest. I was wholly awake, and it was horribly late. I listened. There was something undefinably astir in the house. The soft breath of the open casement just moved the half-drawn blind. I took a candle and went straight out of the room. I cannot say what guided me. I went along the corridor, holding my candle high, till I came within sight of the tall window over the great staircase. My candle went out. There was someone on the stair. Quint! He knew me as well as I knew him. He fixed me, exactly as he had fixed me before. I felt that if I stood my ground a minute, he would cease. There was nothing in me that did not meet and measure him. It was the dead silence of our long gaze at such close quarters that gave the whole horror. I can't express what followed, save by saying that the silence itself became the element into which he disappeared, down the staircase and into the darkness. <gasps> you! She was there, seated on the lower steps, her back towards me, her body bowed, her head in her hands, but I knew exactly what dreadful face she had to show. The children! Flora! 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 Her bed was empty. I dashed at the place where I had left her lying. The sheets were disarranged. The white curtains deceivingly pulled forward. Flora! You naughty... Where have you been? Her grave, candid little face, in the glow of her golden curls, appeared from behind the window blind. You were looking for me out of the window. You thought I might be walking in the grounds. Well, you know, I thought someone was. And did you see anyone? <laughs> there was a figure. A figure in the grounds. I felt sick as I made it out. Miles! Miles, you must tell me now. The truth. What did you go out for? What were you doing out there? I wonder if I tell you why. Will you understand? My heart leapt into my mouth. Would he tell me why? I found no sound on my lips. My only reply, a vague, grimacing nod. Well, just exactly in order that you should do this. Do what? Well, think me, for a change, bad. Then you didn't go to bed at all? Not at all. I sat up and read. And when did you go out? At midnight. You see, when I'm bad, I am bad. But just think what I might do. I see. I see it is charming. But how could you be sure I would see you? Oh, I arranged that with Flora. Well, she was to get up and look out. Which is what she did do. So, to see what she was looking at. You also looked. You saw. While you caught your death in the night air. How otherwise should I have been bad enough? It 
all lies in half a dozen words. Words that really settle the matter. Just think what I might do. He knows down to the ground what he might do. That's what he gave them a taste of at school. Oh, you do change. I don't change. I simply make it out. The four depend upon it perpetually meet. If last night you had been with either child, you would have understood. I go on, I know, as if I were crazy, and it's a wonder I'm not. What I have seen would have made you so, but it has only made me more lucid, made me get hold of still other things. Well, what other things have you got hold? Why, of the very things that have delighted and yet strangely mystified me. They're more than unearthly beauty. They're absolutely unnatural goodness. It's a game, it's a policy, and a fraud. On the part of the little darlings? Yes, mad as that seems. They have not been good. They have only been absent. It has been easy to live with them because they've simply been leading a life of their own. They're not mine, they're not ours. They're his and they're hers. Quint and Miss Jessels? Quint and Miss Jessels. They want to get to them. What can they do now? Do? Do they do enough? They can destroy them. Unless, of course, we can prevent it. Well, their uncle must prevent it. He must take them away. And who's to make him? Well, you, miss. By writing to him that his house is poisoned and his little nephew and niece mad. And if they are, miss? And if I am myself, you mean? That's charming news to be sent to him by a governess whose prime undertaking was to give him no worry. Yes. He do hate worry. That was the great reason. Why those fiends took him in so long. No doubt. Though his indifference must have been awful. Oh, but he ought to be here, miss. He ought to help. You see me asking him for a visit. If you should so lose your head as to appeal to him for me. Yes, miss. I would leave on the spot both him and you. There were conditions of sound and stillness that brought back to me the feeling I had when I first saw Quint. I recognised the signs, the portents, the moment. But they remained unaccompanied and empty. The fact that days passed without another encounter ought to have done something towards soothing my nerves. It was impossible to get rid of the cruel idea that whatever I had seen, Miles and Flora saw more. There were times of our being together when I would have been ready to swear that the children had visitors who were known and were welcome. This left a chill which we vociferously denied we felt, and the children would laugh with a kind of wild irrelevance and ask, When do you think our uncle will come? Don't you think we ought to write to him? He never wrote to them. And I carried out my pledge not to appeal to him when I let them understand that their own letters were but charming literary exercises. They were too beautiful to be posted. I kept them myself. It is extraordinary that in spite of my tension, I never lost patience with the children. It little matters, for relief arrived though only the relief that the burst of a thunderstorm brings to a day of suffocation. It was at least change. And it came with a rush. Gross are so far ahead. We should be late, and we don't want them to have to wait outside the church for us in this weather. Well, look here, my dear. You know, well, when in the world, please, am I going back to school? You know, my dear, that for a fellow to be with a lady, always... And always with the same lady. Of course, she's a jolly, perfect lady. But after all, I'm a fellow that's, well, you know getting on. (laughs) Yes, you're getting on. You can't say I've not been awfully good, can you? No, 
I can't say that, Miles. Except for just that one night, you know. That one night? When I went out. Went out of the house. Oh, yes. But I forget what you did it for. Well, you forget? Why, well, it was to show you I could. Oh, yes, you could. And I can again. Certainly. But you won't. No. Not that again. It was nothing. It was nothing. We must go on. We shall be late for church. Well, then, when am I going back? Were you very happy at school? Oh, I'm happy enough anywhere. Well, then, if you're just as happy here... Oh, but that isn't everything. Of course, well, you know a lot. You hint that you know almost as much. Not half I want to. But it isn't so much that. What is it, then? Well, I want to see more... life. I see. I see. I want my own sort. There are not many of your own sort, Miles. Unless, perhaps, dear little Flora. <laughs> you really compare me to a baby girl? Don't you, then, love our sweet little Flora? And if I didn't? And you too, my dear. If I didn't? We had arrived within sight of the church. I tried to quicken our step, but he stopped me by the pressure of his arm. Yes, if you didn't. He didn't move. Well, you know what? Does my uncle think as you do? How do you know what I think? <laughs> well, of course I don't. It strikes me that you never tell me. But I mean, does he know? Know what, Miles? By well, the way I'm going on. Well, I don't think your uncle much cares. Well, you don't think he can be made to? In what way? Why, by his coming here, of course. But who'll get him to come here? I will. I wanted to get away from him. It was beyond repair. Here was my chance. There was no one to stop me. It was only a question of hurrying to the house, which would be practically unoccupied. I came straight out of the churchyard, retracing my steps through the park to the house. I had made up my mind. I would fly. I would get off quickly, without a scene, without a word. I made straight for the schoolroom. There, seated at my own table, dishonoured, tragic, she was all before me, dark as midnight in her black dress, her haggard beauty and unutterable woe. You terrible, miserable woman! She looked at me as if she heard me. The next moment... There was nothing in the room but the sunshine and a sense that I must stay. I'm sorry I didn't come into church. Did the children miss me? Oh, yes, miss. They asked me not to say anything. What happened? It's all out. Between Miles and me, it's all out now. All out? But what, miss? Everything. It doesn't matter. I've made up my mind. I came home, my dear, for a talk with Miss Jessel. A talk? What do you mean she spoke? She wants Flora. As I've told you, however, it doesn't matter. Because you've made up your mind. Oh, but to what? To send for their uncle. Oh, yes, Miss in pity, do. Ah, but I will. I will. It's the only way. What's out, as I told you, with Miles, is that he thinks I'm afraid to. Well, he shall see he's mistaken. Oh, yes, Miss. I'll tell his uncle that I can't work with a child who's been expelled. Oh, for we've never in the least known what. For wickedness. For what else? When he's so clever and beautiful and perfect. Is he stupid? Is he untidy? Is he ill-natured? No, he's exquisite. So it can be only that, and that would open up the whole thing. After all, it's their uncle's fault if he left them here with such people. But he didn't really know them, miss. The fault's mine. Well, you shan't suffer. Well, the children shan't. Oh, yes, miss. You right. I will. That night I sat for a long time before a blank sheet of paper... Rain lashing and wind battering against my window. Finally, I went out, 
taking a candle, I crossed the passage to listen at Miles's door. I say you there. Come in. How did you know I was there? Well, I heard you, of course. You fancy you make no noise. You're like a troop of cavalry. Then you weren't asleep? Not much. I lie awake and think. What is it that you think of? Well, what in the world, my dear? But you. Oh. I had much rather you slept. Well, I think also, you know, of this strange business of ours. What strange business, Miles? Well, the way you bring me up. And all the rest. What do you mean by all the rest? Oh, you know. You know. Certainly you shall go back to school, if that's what troubles you. But not to the old place. You must find another. A better. Do you know, you've never said anything to me about your school. The old one, I mean. Never mentioned it in any way. Haven't I? No, never. You've never mentioned to me one of your teachers, one of your friends, or the least little thing that ever happened to you at school. Therefore, you can fancy how much I am in the dark. Until this morning, you had never made reference to anything in your previous life. I thought you wanted to go on as you are. Oh, I don't. I don't. I want to get away. You're tired of Bly? Oh, no. No, I like Bly. Well, what then? Oh, you know. You know what a boy wants. You want to go to your uncle? <laughs> you can't get away with that. My uncle must come here and you must completely settle things. If we do, you may be sure it will be to take you quite away. Oh, don't you understand? That's exactly what I've been working for. You'll have to tell him about the way you've let it all drop. You'll have to tell him an awful lot. And how much will you, Miles, have to tell him? There are things he'll ask you. Oh, very likely. But what things? Things you've never told me. To make up his mind what to do with you. He can't send you back. Oh, I don't want to go back. I want a new field. Oh, dear, little Miles. Well, old lady. Is there nothing at all that you want to tell me? I told you. I told you this morning. That you want me not to worry you. To let me alone. I've just begun a letter to your uncle. Well, then, finish it. What happened before? Before what? Before you came back and before you went away. What happened? Oh, dear little Miles. Oh, dear little Miles, if only you knew how I want to help you. I'd rather die than hurt a hair of you. But Miles, you must help me save you. <gasps> My dear. <laughs> Candles out. It was I who blew it, dear. Good morning, Miss. Have you written? Yes, here. Take it. Please make sure it is sent off this afternoon. Very good, miss. It does play beautifully, doesn't it? Oh, yes. Yes. The children have had quite a brilliant morning. Miles has ever been such a little gentleman. After breakfast, he insisted on playing for me. Yes. He does play very well. Where is Flora? 
Why, my dear? How do I know? Flora. 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 Mrs. Gross? Mrs. Gross? Mrs. Gross, have you seen Flora? Where is she? Oh, no, Miss. Well, perhaps she's upstairs. No. She's at a distance. She has gone out. She's with her. With her? We must find them. Oh, where's Master Miles? Oh, he's with Quint. Oh, Lord's Miss. The trick's played. They've successfully worked their plan. He found the most divine little way to keep me quiet while she went off. Divine? Oh, infernal, then. He has provided for himself as well. But come. You leave him? So long with Quint. Yes. I have no choice. I was certain that wherever Flora might be, she was not near home. She would be on the spot where we had first seen Miss Jessel. We went straight to the lake. Oh, where is she, miss? There's no sign of Flora. No. No. Wait. Look. The empty mooring. She has taken the boat. She has used it to cross the lake. All alone? No child. She's not alone. I'll have to walk, far as it is. Mrs. Gross, you must go back to the house. Find Miles. Wait for me there. It was a devious, tiresome process, on ground much broken and by a path choked with overgrowth. In a few minutes, I found the boat. There she is. Flora! Why? What are you doing out here? What are you doing, my dear? And where's Miles? I'll tell you, if you'll tell me. Well, what? Where? My pet is Miss Jessel. She's there. She's there. She's there, you unhappy little thing. There. 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 And you see her as well as I see. Only look, child. Look! I don't know what you mean. I see nobody. I see nothing. I never have. I think you're cruel. I don't like you. Go away. Leave me alone. Or take me away from her. I've lost you. I've done my best, but I've lost you. Go! Go! I must have stayed there long, for when I raised my head, the day was almost done. I looked a moment through the twilight at the grey pool and its blank, haunted edge. Then, I went back to the house. I saw nobody on my return. I went straight to my room. Flora's belongings had all been removed. There was a mortal coldness. I felt as if I should never again be warm. Flora's terrible feverish, miss. I don't think she slept all night. And the thing she says. She persists in denying she saw anything. Oh, miss, it isn't a matter on which I can press her. It's made her, every inch of her, quite old. She'll never speak to me again. I think, miss, she never will. She asked me every three minutes if I think you're coming in. Oh, I see. Has she said anything at all about Miss Jessel? Nothing, miss. And of course, I take it from her that by the lake, well, just then and there at least, there was nobody. And naturally you take her at her word. I don't contradict her, miss. What else can I do? Oh, nothing in the world. You've the cleverest little person to deal with. What Flora wants, of course, is to get rid of me. 
But I've a better idea. My going would seem the right thing. And on Sunday I was terribly near it. Yet that won't do. It is you who must go. You must take Flora. Where in the world? Away from here. Away from them. Away even from me. Straight to her uncle. There is one thing, however. The children mustn't, before she goes, be together even for a moment. Oh, yes, miss. I understand. At present she's alone. What about Master Miles? I think he wants to give me an opening. I do believe he wants to speak. But I must give him more time. If nothing comes, I shall only fail. And at worst, you will have at least helped Flora by taking her away. I'll go, miss. I'll go this morning. It's this place. She must leave it. Your idea is the right one. And I myself, miss. Well? I can't stay. You mean you have seen? I've heard. Heard? Oh, from Miss Flora. Horrors from one so young. It's beyond everything. But I can think where she picked it up. I can't bear it. But I must get her away. Far from here. Far from them. Then, in spite of yesterday, you believe? I believe. Oh. 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 There's one thing. Of course, my letter to the children's uncle will have reached home before you. Your letter won't have got there, miss. Your letter never went. What? Master Miles. You mean he took it? I see. Leave us. Leave us. He'll meet me. He'll confess. If he tells me everything, he's saved. And if he's saved... Then we all are. As soon as she had gone, I missed her on the spot. By the time I had settled my nerves enough to come downstairs, their carriage had already rolled out of the gates. Miles had disappeared outside. He had his freedom now. I waited for him in the drawing room. When at last he returned, he simply stood a moment, his back to me, with his hands in his pockets. There, behind him in the shadows, Quint, that white face of damnation, the scoundrel fixed to watch and wait. I say, my dear, is Flora really very awfully ill? Not so bad, but Bly had ceased to agree with her. I see, I see. So we're alone? Oh, more or less. Not absolutely. It depends what you call alone. Yes, everything depends. Well, I think I'm glad Bly agrees with me. I hope that you have been enjoying yourself. Oh, yes. I've been ever so far. I've never been so free. He was right there, full upon us. It was like fighting with a demon for a human soul. Well, and do you like it? Do you? Of course, if we are alone together, it's you that are alone the most. Miles, do you remember how I told you that night in your bedroom how there is nothing in the world that I would not do for you? Yes. Yes. Only that, I think, was to get me to do something for you. Oh, yes. Yes, it was, partly for that. But you know, you didn't do it. Yes. You wanted me to tell you something. Is that why you've stayed? Yes. Yes, it is precisely for that. Well, I will tell you. I will tell you. I'll tell you everything. I mean, I'll tell you anything you like. But you stay with me, and we shall both be all right. I will tell you, I will. Only, not now. Very well. I'll wait for what you've promised. Only in return, you must tell me one small thing now. 
One small thing. Yes, yes, one small thing. Tell me if yesterday afternoon you took my letter. Yes, I took it. And what did you take it for? To see what you said about me. You opened the letter. I opened it. And you found nothing. 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 Is that what you did at school? At school? Is that why you can't go back? Well, did you know I can't go back? I know everything. Everything? Everything. So did you? Did you take things? No, I didn't steal. Then what did you do? I said things. To whom did you say them? I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember their names. Was it to everyone? To those I liked. No more. No more. No more. Is she here? She? Miss Jessel. Miss Jessel. It's not Miss Jessel. He's here. Here for the last time. It's him. Who do you mean by him? Peter Quint. Yes. Peter Peter Quint, you you devil. devil. I caught him. Yes, I held him. It may be imagined with what a passion. But at the end of a minute, I began to feel what it truly was that I held. We were alone alone with the quiet day. day. And his little heart, dispossessed, had stopped. Thank you for listening to Boxtail Soup's adaptation of The Turn of the Screw. This production was originally adapted for the stage from the novel by Henry James and has been reimagined for audio. It was performed by Noel Byrne and Antonia Christophers. Original music composed and performed by Dan Melrose. Mixing and sound design for audio by John Fingers Wood. Hi again. Thanks for listening to the show and we really hope you enjoyed it. If you've already decided to help us, you can skip this part, but if not, I'm here to remind you. With all our performances cancelled, Boxtail Soup's future is a little uncertain at the moment. You can help us in one of three ways. First, if you can afford to, please consider becoming a patron. That means making a regular donation to Boxtail Soup, which helps to keep the company going and also gives you a few special perks just for patrons. Second, if you enjoyed the show but can't become a patron, then maybe you could give us a one-off donation. Think of it like the price of a ticket, only you get to decide the price of that ticket. Third, if you enjoyed it but you can't make a donation, then help us spread the word. Hit like, subscribe, leave a comment, tell your friends, share the show and help us reach more audience. Thanks for listening, and with your help, we'll see you in a theatre again someday soon.